If you have the word of God, would you turn, please, to 2 Timothy 3.16. Just as you turn there, uh, this afternoon I was sitting outside the assembly I go to in the car, just reading the Bible, just waiting on my daughter. And just, just read in John chapter 3, verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's not an intellectual head knowledge that you need to have of the Saviour. It's heart knowledge that you need to have of him and his work on the cross. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the apostle is is speaking of the common apostasy. This know also... That in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affraction, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness yet denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Uh, In the months before I got saved, these verses came to me through my iPod and over the radio over and over again. And that there just describes the sort of person that I was before I was saved. I was born in 1974. I was born into a Christian home. I thank God every day that I was born in a Christian home. It is a great blessing to be born in a Christian home. Uh, my mother and father were saved in Windsor Avenue in, Port- uh, in Lurgan, sat under Mr. Mullen, uh, and I was the last of three children. And from a very early age, I was led to know that I was a sinner in need of a savior. And there was a thing in my life called sin that was separating me from a holy God. Uh, Like I say, I was the the three, the third out of three children. I have a sister, Jacqueline, and a brother called Mark. Uh, Mark was my big brother. He was 10 years older than me, and I looked up to him. He was a mod and all the rest of it. This was at the start of the 80s. And then one day, we went on a family holiday with my, my granny and granda to the Isle of Man. And we had to cut the holiday short because Mark took headaches, really severe headaches. Uh, We returned to Northern Ireland. Uh, Mark was brought to our family doctor. He said he had just a cold. Then he he was brought down a couple of times to the doctor. And the doctor sort of kept pushing him away. My father, we didn't have much money. Uh, My father paid the money for to go and see a specialist in Craigavon Area Hospital. The specialist took one look at him and realized that there was something a lot more serious wrong with my brother and sent him straight down to Ward 41 of the Royal Victoria Hospital to neurosurgery. Uh, Mark was diagnosed with a double brain tumor uh, and sat through what was at the time the longest operation in the UK, 11 and a half hours. Mark went into hospital he was a good looking young man, long black hair. Uh, like I say, I looked off, up to him. Um, my first memory of going into the hospital the night after my brother had his operation, he was laying in bed, and I can only describe what he was covered in was like a white onion sack with tubes coming out of his mouth and his nose, and a tube coming from his brain to drain fluid off the brain. And I run out of the hospital. It freaked me out completely. Uh, A thing that I learned when I was very young in life is that the best of men with the best intentions can sometimes make the worst mistake. And our doctors had misdiagnosed my brother. And Mark come out of his operation. I'm sure I don't need to tell anybody in this in this building because everybody knows what serious illness does to that person. There's a long time of recuperation. Uh, we lived in a, in a small house in West Street in Portadown, and I shared a room with my brother. Uh, when Mark was recuperating 
often at nights, Mark's breathing would change. I would hear his breathing change, go in and alert my mother and father. They would phone the ambulance. Mark would be carted off to the hospital, and this went on and on and on. So my childhood basically ended when I was seven years old. Uh, my brother had five good years. Roy spoke of my brother there uh, when we were in just after the prayer meeting. Mark had a, a great testimony. In those five years, he was born again. Unfortunately, Mark died uh, when I was 11. And uh, I can remember walking behind my brother's coffin. My mother and father were godly people. They'd never done nothing wrong. They worshiped God, they praised him. They instilled in me a fear of God and a respect for the scriptures. And yet here was me walking behind their first son's coffin. Uh, I made the decision then that if that is what a holy God does to people that love him, well, I want nothing to do with this God. And from the age of, of 12 to the age of 34, I lived my life my way. Uh, my life was Christless. It was godless. And when I look back on it now, God was so gracious to me. He could just righteously have lifted me and set me into hell where I belonged and I wouldn't have a word to say but he didn't. He had other plans for my life. As I'm not going to stand here and speak about those 22 years and retort to you some of the depths of sin that I fell into. There's no need to that. And I'm here to glorify the Lord, not to glorify sin. I will just simply go to two places. When I was 21, I met a young lady called Helen. I fell in love with her, and I'll come back to that, so I will. Um, but there was another place in them 22 years. Things happened in my life and I had to get out of Northern Ireland. I was living in Scotland and uh, I got a job. I was into drink, I was into drugs and all the rest of it. On my 27th birthday, I can remember, my friend and I went to, and bought a load of heroin. Uh, we took it and I had to go to work the next day. Oh, no, I had to quit work because it felt as if somebody had just left a knife in the back of my head. And I can remember walking home from work that morning. It was a long walk. It was two and a half, three miles walk home in the rain. And I remember thinking to myself, you're going to be found dead in a flat over here in Scotland and nothing is worth that. And I made the conscious decision there that no matter what I was coming home to in Portadown, I was coming home. So we got onto the boat and we come home. I think I should tell you that all of, all of my friends in my life, that I grew up with men, and they were all in paramilitaries. Um, and that is the sort of circles that I moved in. I uh, come home from Scotland, and like I say, I'm, I had this young lady, Helen. Helen and I fell in love. And after 11 years, uh, we got married in Cyprus. After the first year of our marriage, it was nearly over because I was living my life for my way. I was selfish, I was self-centered, I had no thoughts. I don't actually know what Hal never really seen in me. She must have seen something in me because she stayed with me. And uh, like I say, after nearly one year of marriage, our marriage was over. Uh, there was questions in my life. Life is basically boring. Now that is quite a statement to make from a pulpit. But if you put it up beside the statement that the Lord makes in John 10, verse 10, where he says, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, you maybe start to see what I'm talking about. You go round in circles in life. You go to the pub, you drink, you go to work, you do. And this goes on and on. And I was having years and years of this. And there had to be more out there. So I began questioning what life was all about. Now I'm up to where I'm 34 now. And I had got a good job. I always had a good job. And Helen's had a good job. And I was working away in an engineering factory in Portadown. And there was a man in this place. And none of the other boys liked this man. But I couldn't understand why they didn't like this man. I had no problem with it at all. He was straight as a day. And he was a Christian. And I know now that I'm a Christian myself that the reason they didn't like him was because he was a Christian, because the world doesn't like you when you get saved. But this man had a testimony before me, and I watched this man, and I couldn't say really anything bad about this man. And he invited me to a meeting, 
in the Presbyterian Church in Portadown, and it was Christianity Explored. And I said, out of respect for him, I said, yes, I will, I'll go. So I stayed sober on the Saturday night, and I went to this meeting on the Sunday, and uh, answered all the questions, asked all the questions, and everything was great. And then there was this wee girl come over to me, called her Michelle, and she gave me her testimony. And she said to me at the end of it, I'll never forget it, she said, Johnny, you know, I can't do it for you. It's something you have to do yourself. And basically, I hadn't got the guts to do it. And this wee girl that was standing before me had more guts in her wee finger than I had in all of my body. And this started me thinking that I started to come under conviction. Now, in December 2008, uh, I was at my friend's house where we were having a party. And he came into the room, and I was sitting in the room, and he said to me, are you going to become a Christian? Because I had been questioning life and asking, and all the boys had sensed that I was questioning what, what it was all about. And he said to me, are you going to become a Christian? And I said, no, no, not at all. And he says, great, will you be my groomsman? And I says, yes, brilliant. So I gave him a hug, and he walked out of the room. And as soon as he walked out of the room, I sobered up like that there. Because I knew at that spot I had denied Christ access to my life. And if anything ever happened to me from there on in, that would be played back to me. I knew I had, I had enough grip on the Word of God, even there, to know that everything that I had done in my life would be played back to me. And I knew that this, this one moment, above all other moments, would be the convicting moment for me. And I say this reverently, that put the fear of God in me, so it did. And I, I, was, I was shaking at that. Now I decided to train for the Belfast Marathon to try and get my head off Christianity, off the love of God, off a saviour who went to the cross for me, who shed his precious blood, who God raised again the third day for my justification. And I knew all this and I had to get this out of my mind. So I took up running to forget all about this. But unfortunately, I went on to a website uh, that he called the website Arse Evangelists Now with the Lord And there was a man on That website And it was called Pastor Mullen And I downloaded A lot of this man's uh, Messages On the Gospels On the footsteps of Christ On Romans On Revelations On happenings ahead And I was out pounding the roads Trying to forget about God and Mr. Mullen was speaking in my ears, and it was left perfectly clear to me that I was on my way to hell, and I needed a, 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 a saviour, and what God had provided one for me in the form of his son. And uh, this went on, and in February 2009, my daughter was born, Lauren, and we got Lauren home from the hospital, and Helen handed me Lauren, and Helen seen that there was a big problem in my life and that I had questions about things. And Helen said to me, are you happy? And I remember standing at the top of the stairs and, and saying to Helen, yes, I'm happy, but I have no peace. And Helen just didn't understand what was going on. She thought it was something that she had done, but it was within me. It was the sin question within me. And that's where the problem lay. Now, the Marthans in May, and uh, I was training and training and training and training. My mother and father bought me this Bible for a wedding present seven years ago. And I never looked at it. I never looked at a Bible for 22 years. But I thank God for it now because it was the best wedding present I'd ever got. Now I was out one day. If you just turn over to First Timothy chapter 4. And like I say, I never looked at a Bible for 22 years. I was out running. I had run 20 miles. And I was just coming into the house. And I, I lay in the bed. And I just took the Bible out of its box. And I threw the Bible out in the bed. And the Bible opened at this page. And my eyes fixed on verse 8. For bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that now is. And of the life 
and of that which is to come. And I knew God was speaking to me through his word because I had been out running and trying to get fit. And this verse just told me that whatever I was trying to do, it didn't matter. I was still in rebellion against God and I needed to throw down the arms of my rebellion. Helen was in the room and I told Helen that God was speaking to me and she thought I was nuts. She hadn't a clue. Helen didn't come from a religious background at all. Helen thought I was mad. And uh, so I, I knew that God, God was speaking to me. Now, just before the marathon, I went out for a, a really big long run. And as I was coming just into Portadown, just for the end of the run, there was a, a 40 foot lorry come flying past me. And as I stand here in the pulpit now, I can still feel it going past me. It, it missed me by about an inch. And it just careered on down the, lo- the, the road, never stopped, never looked behind me. And I just burst into tears when the lorry went past, because I knew that if that lorry hit me, that was me. I wouldn't see Helen, I wouldn't see Lauren, but most of all, I knew that I'd be in hell, and hell for eternity. And there was a big, big gap in my heart. God has created man, the heart of man, the soul of man so big that only one thing can fill it, and that's his son. And I knew this, and I was under deep conviction. The next day was Friday. I don't need this anymore because it was the greatest day of my life, so it was. Uh, the next day was Friday. We went into work, and I was sitting in work, uh, working away. I went down into, down into the aisles and was standing in the aisles. Mr. Mullen was preaching in my ears on my iPod on Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne that speaks of the purity, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no, no place for them. And that speaks of authority. And then it goes on down there and it gets to verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that spoke to me of the gravity of the situation, the eternality of my damnment in the lake of fire because my name was not in the book of life. And that was me bait. I was bait. I stood in the middle of our work uh, working out, like I say, in an engineering company, no shrinking violets, all big men, welders and all the rest of it, and I'm standing there at 12 o'clock on a Friday crying my eyes out, and nobody knows what's going on with me. Conviction, that's what it was. It was real Holy Ghost, old time conviction, and that's what it takes, and that's what it took for me, and I thank God for it. Uh, I went and I just clocked out of work. Jumped into the car, uh, drove home, drove home at 30 mile an hour up the jail carriageway because I was feared if I had a, if I had an accident I'd be in hell. I was righteously in hell. It was where I deserved to be, but I had got so far away from God I didn't know how to get back to Him. I got into the house. And my father, and my mother were there. My wife was there. I wasn't expecting my wife to be there. Sort of threw me a bit. And I went into the house. But my, my wife noticed that I had been crying. My eyes. I walked just walked straight past her, got a cup of tea and went out and sat outside and had a smoke. And I was sitting outside and there was all these questions. What's everybody going to think of you? What this, what that, what they are? And I don't know what happened to me, but I just got up out of that seat, walked into the front room. And my father was sitting there. I looked at my dad straight in the face and I said, Dad, I'm a sinner and I need a saviour. And my dad burst out laughing in my face. He said, son, that's great, come on. And what actually happened the night before, my father called round at my Uncle Alan's house, and he said to my Uncle Alan, Jonathan's under great, great conviction, I feel. Pray for him. And that was on the Thursday night. And by two o'clock on the Friday, I was sitting on my knees in the bedroom with my father, crying my eyes out telling the Lord that I was a, sil- a sinner. And I said to my dad, Dad, I've done some horrible things in my life. Um, the sin question is so big. And my dad explained the sin question to me. And the easiest way to explain the sin question is that Calvary covers it all. And Calvary did cover it all. And I got saved at 5 to 2 on the 24th of April 2009. And I had to go into work on Monday morning. And I I was the union man in our place. And it just so happened, the providence of God had it, that 
the union meeting was on Monday morning and I was saved on the Friday. And you hear the cliche of the young man that gets saved at the weekend and has to go into his work and tell everybody about it on the Monday morning. Well, that was me. I was the head of the meeting and I walked into the canteen and our whole shop floor was there. And just before the meeting started, I stood up and I said, listen, boys, I have done some awful things up them stairs. I have took money away from you and I'm sorry for it. I says, I I met the master, I met the saviour on Friday afternoon at five o'clock and I've got saved and I can't do this anymore. And I just walked out of the meeting and left them all to it. And after the meeting, some of the boys come up to me and they says, I never heard anything like that. I thought you were drunk. And I never heard anything like that. One of the Christians come up to me and he said, you sent a shiver up my spine. I never heard anything like that in my life. And um, I've just had to go on with, and I've had to live before the men that I work with. Uh, My wife wasn't saved. Uh, For 14 months, I prayed liquid, liquid prayers for my wife on my knees. And 14 months later, God wonderfully saved my wife, so he did. We have four children now, under four. I'm glad to be out of my hair's going grey. <laughs> I'm glad I've still got her. Um, God has blessed us so, so much. And uh, just thank him every day. Wake up in the morning by putting my head in the pillow at night. I'm not afraid of what happens anymore. I know I'm saved. I know he's preparing a mansion for me in the sky. And I know my name's titled uh, in heaven. Uh, I'd just like to finish by just saying that now I just I live my life by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And thank you very much. You've been very gracious to me. Thank you.